Welcome to Food Friday here on the Hunt Harvest Health Podcast, where we dish out food topics, recipes, and answer your questions related to food, food prep, and nutrition. Find our recipes and tips on our website at huntharvesthealth.com. In today's Hunt Harvest Health episode, Ryan talks all things meat. From bringing the animals out of the hills to putting it on the table for dinner, he gives some of the steps that he uses to procure and make his own meats. We talk on topics about nitrates, hormones, and organic fats, and we give a few recipes like summer sausage and jerky. We hope you enjoy this episode. We get a lot of questions on this topic, so hopefully it helps. You can find this on our website at huntharvesthealth.com slash podcast slash meat prep. Howdy, folks. Okay, so this is episode 11 on the Hunt Harvest Health podcast. And today, we're kind of, we're going to try to go through some of the questions we've been getting, uh, getting asked. Um, There's just a lot of questions on meat prep. We're getting folks asking about, you know, what do you do when you get it back home? And you take it to a butcher and this and that. So I thought we'd just kind of give a brief overview on what we do. Uh, and what what you can do as well and um you know i'd kind of you know follow in suit with everything i, I kind of like to do everything myself and, and be as self-sufficient as possible and it just kind of allows you to know exactly what you're eating uh it never has to go to some processor or butcher and you know a lot of people are totally fine with that uh, i just kind of like to do it myself so i'm i'm a part of every single aspect of uh, getting that meat and, and getting it into the freezer so Obviously, once you've uh, once you've got the uh, the meat, you know, pulled it out of your backpack and and you're heading home. Um, one little tip that I've that I've learned over the years is once you once you got the meat back uh, to to the truck, um, instead of just throwing it into the cooler and just kind of letting it sit uh, in the bottom of that thing with, you know, it'll it it probably have some blood leaking out of it instead of just letting it sit because some trips you know you're shoot you're five six hours away or more uh, what I'll do is um, before the trip I've, I've got a lot of milk jugs I'll just freeze those up um, you know fill them with water freeze them up and have those as kind of a base layer in my cooler got to have a pretty big cooler for this but uh, what it does it does two things it, it obviously if you freeze those things up solid um, you know, most likely there's still going to be some freeze to them when you get out of the hills. These things last forever if you got a really quality cooler. And there's a lot of quality coolers out there right now, so it makes it makes it pretty easy. Um, the other thing it does is it keeps the keeps the meat from just sitting on the bottom. You know, those milk jugs are kind of lined in the bottom of that. And you can use milk jugs. You can use just big water bottles. The bigger, the better. Obviously, the the more uh, water you've got in there, the the thicker the ice is going to be, the longer it's going to last. So get that meat. I'll, I'll put those game bags right on top of that. And, um, and then obviously I'll, I'll try to get some ice on the top or, and go that route. Um, now I've used dry ice before where I'll put the dry ice in the bottom and, uh, and kind of re refreeze those milk jugs. Um, you know, on the way home, just hit a Walmart or hit a Fred Meyer or something and, and grab a little bit of dry ice. And man, that stuff is, that will freeze anything. So don't put it on the top of your cooler on top of the meat because it will freeze it solid in no time. So once, uh, once you've done that, um, got the meat home, what I like to do is I like to age it a little bit. And I didn't used to do that. Um, I really like the flavor of venison and elk and, um, you know, I, I'll just fix it in a way that it's going to be tender and, and whatnot. But man, there's nothing wrong with hanging it and aging it a little bit, letting that bacteria break down the meat. Uh, to where you're just going to get, you know, tender cuts off of every piece of meat for the most part. So I'll let, I'm, I'm fortunate I've got a walk-in cooler and I, I know not everybody has that, but, um, boy, if you do, it sure is a big advantage if you're, uh, if you're a hunter. So I, I'll just kind of hang that stuff, um, keep them in the game bags and hang that in the walk-in cooler. And, uh, and I'll just hang that for, you know, three, four days more, more likely it ends up being six steps, six, seven days. And it'll get a little bit of a darker, uh, color to the outside. And, and you can kind of just cut that off if it gets to be too much, but man, that just breaks that meat down. And you'll notice when you're cutting it up, it's just a real soft, gooey, 
you know, perfect, perfect cuts of meat. And again, kind of going back, uh, game bags, ah, oh, man, there's so many good game bags out there right now. Um, it, it's one more piece of technology that's really helped us guys that spent a lot of time in the back country and early hunts, archery hunts, September hunts, when you still got warm weather. Um, man, I remember using, you know, the older game bags we used to have were just kind of a, a real loose cotton. Um, they were kind of a one use deal where they you use them once and then you throw them away basically. Whereas today, man, there's some great game bags out there. Tag bags make some phenomenal ones. Caribou bags, they're almost like, uh, well, the caribou ones, they're almost like a pillow sheet, you know, and I've used pillow sheets before. Um, and what that does and, and super important for me in the early hunts, uh, is flies. It keeps the flies out. You really want a game bag that's, um, well, first of all, it's gotta be pretty lightweight. You don't want to be, you know, yarding something too heavy back in there. So getting them to be as small as possible, um, to where you're able to kind of split, like, like for, for instance, on a deer, you know, I'll have four game bags and you can split, split that deer up four ways. Um, and just kind of be aware that that's what it's going to take. Elk is a little bit more, you know, typically we'll have about six game bags, a little bit larger for the, uh, for the elk and, and quartering those up and, and whatnot. It's kind of what it takes to, uh, to pull all the meat off of a big old bull. But, um, yeah, the game bags are, are phenomenal. They're super light. I think tag bags are the, the, probably the best synthetic as far as weight. Um, and, uh, yeah, it, it, they're light to keep the bugs out. Um, and all these new game bags, they're, they're washable, easy to, easy to clean. So you can reuse them. Um, I've had some caribou bags that I've used for, geez, I don't know how many years now and I'll, I'll use them and then just throw them in the washer and wash them up. And they're as good as new. Um, and one, one other thing I do with those is I, I'll vacuum pack them just to get, get them as small as possible before I go in. So I'm going into the mountains. I've got all my game bags backpack pressed as, as small as I can get them. And that just, you know, gives me a little extra space in my backpack. But, uh, so back to the meat, um, you know, once I've got it in the cooler and it's, it's broke, you know, the bacteria's had a chance to break it down a little bit, then comes processing time. So I'll pull that stuff out. Um, it's not whole, not really a whole lot of, um, tools or, or equipment needed for this. It's just really a sharp knife. Uh, I've always got a an electric sharpener there on hand and keep that thing really super sharp. Uh, I've got about four or five buckets, one for scraps, uh, junk. And then, uh, you know, I've got a few of them laid out for burger and, and a couple of them laid out for steaks. So it's really up to you. You know, you kind of got to decide what you're going to want as far as steaks versus burger or sausage or whatever you're going to use it for. I tend to go heavy on the burger. Um, I always use certain cuts for steak. Um, you know, certain cuts on the quarter, the hind quarters I'll use for steak. Typically all the shoulder meat goes into the burger bag and, um, obviously back strap, tender loins. Those are all, I'm staking those babies up and those are by far my favorite. So, uh, but yeah, you can get a really nice, get two really nice roasts off those hind quarters and, uh, I'll, I'll keep those separate and, and do the steaks with just those choice cuts of meat. But, um, yeah. So after that, you know, you, you kind of get them all washed up, get all the hair off, uh, take your knife and, and man, just pull every bit of fat you can off of that. Deer fat is not good. It, it, it really has a, a foul taste to it. I don't know why it's different from say bear fat, but it just does. And usually elk don't have a ton of fat on them, but they do, um, you know, all the fascia and, and anything white on that meat, I'm basically straight. I'm, I'm cutting that off. Um, for one thing, my wife hates anything chewy in her steak. So, um, I can chew on it and be happy, but she really doesn't like any of that stuff. So I'm, I'm trying to pull every piece of fascia I can. And as far as venison goes, you know, that really eliminates any, most of the gaminess to it. You know, once you've let that game or that animal hang, you've, uh, you've let it get broke down a little bit in that respect and then cut all the fat and all the sinew and, uh, fascia off of it. And then you just got a really quality piece of meat there. So, um, what I do after I've got that, I'll kind of sectioned out. I've got the burger in the buckets. Um, you know, got the, got the couple buckets sitting there for, for the, uh, steaks. 
I will, I will clean it all up again and make sure I've got every, every piece of hair, everything off of it. And then basically what I'll do is I'll get that meat dried. Kind of like to, uh, I just lay out, you know, some towels and, um, or some paper towels or whatever you've got, clean that meat up, put it on there, let it dry. I don't typically like to vacuum pack it when it's really wet. I'd rather get it nice and dry. Um, keep that moisture out of there. So I'll kind of, uh, you know, get my, get my vacuum pack bags out, get all those steaks vacuum packed up. Um, again, you want a pretty good quality bag for that. And what I'll do is, um, you know, you can get the pre-cut bags or, or you can get, you know, bags that you cut yourself and I'll get those just cause they're cheaper and I'm a cheap wad. So you get those, you cut them yourself and I'll always double seal them, you know, use that heat bar to double seal every, every side. I've just found that it kind of eliminates one more thing that can go wrong. You know, one little crease or one bad seal in there that, that could open up and, and give you some spoilage in the freezer. So I'll just double seal both sides. Um, you know, obviously super, you know, common sense, get them marked, you know, at the date, what it is, maybe the, the, the type of, you know, what piece it is, you know, backstrap, tenderloin, hind quarter, whatever, um, roast. And then, you know, I'll get that and I'll, I'll get that into the freezer. Um, as far as burger goes, man, I've, I've really, I've really come to enjoy just, just making up my own burger. Obviously, you know, a lot of people will just take that burger, run it to a butcher and let them have at it and then pick it up later. And I used to do that. Um, but I always kind of had a, a feeling like, man, I, I want to know more about what's going in there. I don't know the fat that's getting added to it. Um, you know, I don't know how clean it is, how, how they're doing it, if it's my meat. So I just prefer to keep it, you know, keep it home and, and do it myself. And it's, man, it's so easy to do. You do need a couple of pieces of equipment. You need a good grinder. Um, now I use just a Cabela's brand grinder. It's, uh, I've got kind of an overkill. It's a one and three quarter horsepower carnivore made by Cabela's. And that thing is, I mean, that'll grind anything anything you put in there, I swear it, you'd probably put a bone in there. It'd probably crumble it, but, um, you don't need that. That is overkill. Uh, you don't need to spend that much on a, on a commercial grinder, but, uh, I do a lot of other things with it. So I kind of wanted the best one, um, that money could buy in that respect. And it is a commercial grade. So I'll get that run through. Um, you know, I'll take, take a lot of that meat. Oh, I should go back. I, First, the fat that you're going to add to this burger, and that's totally up to you what kind and how much you're going to add to it. If you've got access to, uh, you know, some, some clean fat, and when I say clean, I mean fat that you know has been, say, grass-fed. You've, you've got some, some cattle that have, that have had a grass-fed diet where they're not eating a ton of, ton of grains and, and uh, you know, you're just getting a better quality there. Um, and also... Uh, when I say clean, I mean hormone free, nitrite free. A lot of times what I'll do is I'll add a, a bacon um, instead of just a straight fat. I'll just add an uncured bacon uh, to the burger. And what that does is obviously you, I want a little bit of fat to my burger. Um, just makes it patty up nice and, and gets it a really good you know flavor and consistency. So, um, you know, the, the bacon... If it's uncured, it hasn't been processed with anything as far as nitrites or nitrates. And, and there's reasons, and we'll get into that, why I kind of go that way. But uh, yeah, really, really do your homework and try to find somebody that's got some clean fat that you can add. And what you're going to be doing is you're going to be adding anywhere from 10%. If it's straight fat, some guys really like a fatty burger, like 15% or even 20%. Um, now, if you're adding bacon... Remember, there's a lot of meat to that bacon, so you tend to not get away with maybe 10%, but you're, you're more along the lines of 15 to 20% because a lot of that bacon has some, has some actual pork meat to it. So uh, when I do the bacon, I'll, I'll jack the percentage up a little bit and um, it just seems to work out a little better. But um, maybe, maybe Hill, maybe you could go into you know, the effects of uh, like hormones and nitrites and kind of why I've migrated away from just allowing somebody else to do it because I, you know, I, I really, uh, now there's a debate out there whether, you know, nitrates are bad and man, I, 
I don't think there's any debate in my mind. I'd just rather not have it in my food. So we find a lot of natural nitrates in fruits and vegetables that we eat. We don't add it. We don't want to add it to our meat. The nitrate that we add to meat tends to go into the stomach where it's converted to nitrite and it can cause a toxic or cancerous compound called nitrosamines. And that's why we don't like to add that just preservative to, to our if, meat. We don't have to. I mean, it, it really just kind of makes it look pretty and there's not a real advantage to it. So except for, you know, curing it, but most of the stuff we do, it's going in the freezer. So yeah. So those hot dogs that you buy that have nitrates in them, they're pink and juicy looking. That's not how they actually look. They add the nitrate to make it look like that. We don't want to add that extra stuff to our meat. Now, we eat a lot of fruits and vegetables in our diet, and the nitrates are naturally in those compounds. And when you ingest it with a vegetable or fruit that's high in vitamin C or other antioxidants, it doesn't turn into nitrite in the stomach and the nitrosamines to produce nitric oxide in your body, which is good for blood vessel dilation and stuff. So... If you work out a lot yeah, like and you take supplements, you probably are yeah you've heard of nitri- nitric um you, nitric you've oxide. heard of nitric oxide. So this is why you want to eat fruits and vegetables. It helps nitric oxide production, okay, but not the added preservative. You can also use um, we use a salt brine or sea salt, which is an alternative to the uh, the nitrates preserving preserving. Yeah. Uh, the question of hormones. Again, is there's there's a debate with that as well, but we definitely choose hormone free fats because uh, in conventional uh, in conventional like meat production and dairy production, they're adding hormones like estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, uh, and there's some other uh, approved hormones that they can add, and it's basically it's. It's increasing the animal's uh, lean muscle production, which makes more meat, and it also increases their milk production. If you have young children, especially young girls, you don't want to be feeding them a bunch of hormone-laden meats. This is why we choose wild game. This is a big reason. Obviously, Ryan hunts because he loves to hunt, but this is one of the biggest reasons for hunting and getting wild game. Most of those animals, almost all those animals out in the wild are not being exposed to exogenous hormones. So again, choosing like when Ryan talks about bacon fat that he's adding. Yeah, it's uncured. So it's it's uncured. Nitrate free. It's organic. So here's the thing with organic means they cannot give their animals uh, hormone laden feed or injections. So we choose, you know organic meat or fats because we know we're not going to get that if you're going to use something besides like a a bacon that you bought in a store you can get a really good bacon in a store there's a lot of places that'll sell an uncured organic style bacon um you know hormone free yada yada well if you're just looking for some fat or you you know this is where it pays to know a farmer somebody local that that you know what they're feeding uh, they're critters and, and they're not jacking them full or whatever to make them grow faster or, or do whatever. So it, it really pays to know somebody. Um, if, if, if you have that ability, definitely I'd recommend it. Get clean fat from that guy. Uh, and there's certain butchers out there that they're aware of it and they, they go for a, a good grass fed and they know which is which. And, and you can get fat from them, whether it's beef fat, pork fat, um, bacon that, that doesn't have all the stuff added to it. It's just important to remember we're talking about adding fat to the game because game's lean. Fat holds hormones more than like a lean muscle does. So if you're if you're eating a lean piece of meat from that animal, it may be a little different than using the fat from that animal. Again, another good reason to pick an animal that hasn't been given hormones because the the fat really likes to store hormones. Yeah, I used to I used to take meat in and you know every Almost every meat you find out there, pepperoni, jerky, um, summer sausage, most sausages, they, they've all got, they've all been cured with a, a type of nitrate. So it was a struggle when I first tried going away from it. Um, you know, I, I used to, even back when I used to bring meat in to guys, I'd go get my own ingredients and try to keep it to where I knew, you know, the flavorings they were adding weren't 
you know, it wasn't like MSG, um, monosodium glutamate flavored and all that kind of thing. So, um, I, I just seen, it just seems like to me, I'd rather not have it in there. I mean, why there's no point of me having it in there if I don't need it. And I'll just use a simple salt to replace it. So, you know, when it, when it comes to, you know, making burger, um, man, I, I just, it's so easy to do. It's really basically you, you take your, take your clean meat and you take your clean fat and you kind of, you know, run it through the grinder. First time I'll run it through a real coarse setting on that disc. Um, it's, it's one of those things where it just goes through really fast and easy on the next go around is when I'll add the fat, you know, that's when I'll slip in that, that uncured bacon or, or just the straight fat that, um, uh, that I've got from, you know, somebody who's got, you know, a, a pig or a, you know, some beef fat. It's just something that, that I know where it came from. Um, and, uh, and that's at that point, one, one thing also a tip that you can probably want to get out there is just keep that fat fairly cold. It, if you can keep it nice and cool and chilled, um, maybe do process this in a cool room. Uh, it's, it just, it just blends a lot better. Um, you know, when you're adding it and trying to mix it up with, uh, with that straight meat, it, it seems to work a lot better if it, if it's got a nice cold temperature to it. So, um, like I said, it's, it's really just a matter of playing around with it, getting your meat ground up, adding, adding the fat that you want to it. Um, and I don't have, I don't even have a mixer. So I know, I know guys, and, and it's probably going to be a little easier to, to just buy a cheap mixer. You can get a hand mixer that you kind of turn it by yourself or, you know, spend some dollars and, and get a mixer that, that actually, uh, you know, does it, um, does it for you. But shoot, I just do it by hand. You know, I, I grind that meat. I get it all into a big tub. Um, I get the fat blended as best I can. And then, uh, and then I'll run it through again and I'll run it through a more fine disc on the grinder. Most grinders you get, they come with uh, a couple, if not a few different, um, discs that you can kind of go, from coarse to super fine. And so that next go around when I grind it, run it through the grinder, it's just getting blended up. It's getting mixed, um, you know, even a little bit more so than after I hand ground it or, or hand mixed it. So it's at that point that I'm starting to push that either into a bag or a lot of guys will just, you know, uh, wrap it and, you know, use it just a typical wax paper wrap and go that route. Now I prefer to do it the vacuum pack way just because it, it takes all the air out of it. And, um, air is not your friend when it's parked in a freezer for a year. So it's really easy to just get a good, uh, vacuum pack bag and, um, and, uh, you know, stuff that meat into there, one pound, one and a half pound, two pounds, whatever you want. And, uh, yeah, just try to try to use the, uh, your vacuum packer and, and get all that air out. And then, uh, again, same thing, just mark it, label it, get it in the freezer. And, and that's pretty much it. It's, it's such a simple process. And once you've done it, you realize, man, there is nothing to this. So, uh, again, you'll probably be kicking yourself why you weren't doing it before. So really, as far as tools required, it's, it's a grinder. That's an investment and, and then some bags and a vacuum packer. And, and again, if you don't have a vacuum packer, you can always just bag it and then just put it into a wax paper. You can either cut your own or, or buy pre uh, made wax paper squares and kind of wrap that up and tape it and, and toss it in the freezer. So again, super simple. Um, now one, th there's a lot of other things that we'll end up doing with the meat. We do make a lot of, make a lot of jerky. So I will do a couple bags in pieces, maybe some shoulder meat that I'll just mark jerky. And maybe I'm not making that jerky right now because it's middle of hunt season and, and I got more hunts and I'm not going to take the time, but I'll throw it in the freezer, come back to it like this time of year, you know, January, February, and I'll just take it out and then start making some jerky with it. Um, I'll also do a lot of summer sausage. Again, you don't have to jump right on that when you're processing your meat. You can take the ground meat that you've made, uh, whether you added bacon, whether you added any kind of fat. Um, you can take that and basically turn that into a really nice summer sausage at any point throughout the year. Um, I'll make some initially. And then like right now, shoot, I've got a couple packs out today. I'm just going to take that out. It's a bacon flavored, uh, elk and I'm going to take that out and 
yeah, make a couple logs of uh, summer sausage. And that's, man, again, it, every summer sausage you buy or have done for you, it's going to have some stuff in it. It's going to have some nitrites in it. And like Hill said, that's going to have, it's going to give it that nice pink flavor or pink color to it. But I don't need that. I don't need it to look pretty. I just want it to taste good. So, uh, you know, and summer sausage is, is so easy. Yeah, actually, the first time he made his own summer sausage, it's like a brown color. And I'm looking at it going, that doesn't look very good. It, because we are where we've been used in the past to getting the summer sausage from the butcher. And it's this really pretty pink red color. And then the homemade stuff is literally, it looks like brown dirt with yeah, it looks spices like, mixed in. It looks like cooked meat. And I I was thinking, what is that? But I realized that's because we're not adding any of that preservative to it. So it yeah. does look different. Yeah, definitely. But I'm going to argue it tastes better because it's I can way better. I can spice it up with whatever I want. And I think what we're going to do, we're going to do this week is probably put out the recipe that I use to make my summer sausage. And, and I'll talk about it a little bit right now, I guess. It's, it's so easy. It's kind of for one batch. It's two pounds of, of meat. And, um, you know, whatever you want. I, I don't use bear for this. Uh, I use elk and deer for this just because I know it's kind of on the lighter side of getting cooked. Um, I, I may, it may not matter at all as long as you get it above 160 for a, a period of time. But, um, I, I, I use deer and elk for this. So, um, basically take two pounds of burger, take three quarters cup of water. And as far as the seasonings and everything goes, I'll give you mine, but again, anybody can play with this and, and make it more garlicky or, or have more, you know, mustard seed in it or pepper, or, you know, you can spice it up or sweeten it up or whatever. But kind of my, my recipe is two pounds of burger, three quarters cup of water. I put two teaspoons of garlic powder in there and that's garlic powder that I've made super potent stuff. It's not store-bought. Um, and then I'll take a little bit of that liquid smoke because what I'm going to do just to make it fast is I'm not smoking this. Um, I'm just cooking it in the oven and, and it's done in an hour. So it's just kind of something you can do in a day. Um, so I'll add, yeah, one tablespoon of the liquid smoke and then I'll add two tablespoons of mustard seed and then one tablespoon of um, like a, any kind of good sea salt. Um, again, if you want a little saltier, you can, you can add more, you can add less, whatever. And some of the options you can do, you can add like a fennel seed to it. Um, you can add red pepper flakes, you know, any kind of herbs, rosemary, parsley, and then just kind of grind those up really fine um, and uh, and put those in there as well. And most times I'll, I'll add pepper and, and some type of a, a spicy uh, pepper flake or whatever. And, you know, I know I know some guys, they'll add a little agave or or maple syrup or something even to uh, sweeten it up a little bit, which gives it a really good flavor. But also fennel seed will do the same thing. It, it kind of has its own unique sweet flavor to it if you add some of that. So there's a lot of different ways you could go about it. Um, most recipes are real similar in that respect. It's just kind of, you know, what your taste is. And, you know, after you've got all that mixed up in a bowl, um, I just kind of, you know, dig in with my hands and, and mix it up. And it's kind of a messy job, but kind of cool at the same time. And so you get that all blended and basically refrigerate that bowl overnight or, you know, 24 hours is even better. You take it out from the fridge and, and, um, you know, you, you kind of have your, your oven preheated to 350. and it, it, I'll take that, I'll take those, um, I'll take that mix and I'll, I'll basically just roll it into logs. You know, I'll, I'll make it, uh, out of two pounds. That's two big, big logs of summer sausage. And, um, I'll roll those into logs and take a, a parchment paper. Uh, I, I used to do just straight aluminum foil. Now I'll do a parchment paper and then an aluminum foil on top of that parchment paper, just so it's not in contact with the, with the foil. And then I'll take a toothpick or whatever, and just kind of poke a few holes in the bottom of that log where a little bit of that juice is going to escape. Um, there's going to be enough in there to keep it from getting too dry, but I don't want it sitting in, in the juice. Cause there is a lot of juice in there. There's, there's some fat from the, from the grind and all that. So, uh, and basically it's 350 in the oven. Um, you know, I, obviously you put those two logs on, uh, some type of, a um, of a tray that a cookie sheet type 
and there's going to be some leakage out of that. So you're going to have some some liquid coming out of those pieces of foil. Put a pan in the yeah, oven underneath it, it or your wife is going to be very unhappy when you fill the house <laughs> up with smoke the next time she tries, <laughs> tries to cook dinner. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Good advice. Um, yeah, I try to catch those drippings because that will make a mess. But uh, And then basically it's in there for an hour. Um, you can go a little longer than that, but I've found that it works for me. Uh, they're about two inch tall, you know, meat logs so it's uh it cooks pretty fast but 350 for an hour pull it out and uh, i'll just toss them in the fridge let them cool down overnight again or, or whatever and and then just start slicing it you know once it's had time to cool so real simple real easy and it's it's all stuff that you've done yourself and you don't you don't have anybody else adding stuff that you don't know what it is we'll have the recipe on our website so you can access the full recipe on there. Yep, perfect. Well, I think that's probably a wrap as far as what we want to go into with me. Just kind of a general overview, but uh, hope the beginners kind of learn something and, and for guys that want to tackle their own meat and not have to bring it to a butcher, um, there you go. All you can do is just kind of give it a shot, figure out what's working, what's not working, and, and don't be afraid to to jump on it because uh, way more gratifying doing it all yourself from start to finish. Yeah. Thanks, Ben. That was great. All right. Thanks, guys.